Okay, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to prove one really, really important property of integrals, and that is that they are linear. So I'm going to state the theorem here. We're going to let a be less than b and let f and g be bounded functions on the closed interval a, b. We're going to let h be equal to the sum of f and g, and we're going to assume f and g are integrable on the closed interval a, b. Then we also have h is integrable on a, b, and the integral from a to b of h of x dx is equal to the integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the integral from a to b of g of x dx. And we're going to prove this very rigorously using the definition of the Darbo integral. But note, we could also prove this theorem using the Riemann integral, which is uh, integrable if and only if um, the function is Darbo integrable. So we could define our a Riemann sum and we could uh, use the limit laws to um, prove this theorem. But we're not going to do that today because this proof is uh, much more rigorous and can prove a lot more um, intermediary results that do not depend on the fact that f and g are integrable. So going through um, the theorem that we're going to prove, let's, uh, let's start by writing a proof header. So let's let a be less than b, let f and g be bounded functions on the closed interval a, b. We're going to assume that f and g are integrable on a, b, and we're going to let h be equal to f plus g. We're going to let p be an arbitrary partition of the closed uh, interval a, b, uh, going from x naught all the way up to some natural number x or x, some natural number n. So for each i ranging from 1 to n and some bounded function j, we're going to let lowercase m sub i j be the infimum of j on that particular subinterval, and capital M sub i j be the supremum of j on that same subinterval. So what we want to show is that the integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the integral from a to b of g of x dx is equal to the integral from a to b of h of x dx. So let's just quickly recap the definition of the Darbo integral and set up some notation for the video. So for an arbitrary bounded function j on the closed interval a, b, we're going to define the p lower sum of j to be the sum from i is 1 to n of the infimum of j on that particular subinterval that we defined before, multiplied by delta x sub i, which is the width of the subinterval. And similarly, the p upper sum of j to be the sum from 1 to n of the supremum of j on the same subinterval multiplied by the width of the subinterval. It follows that we define the upper integral, and I'm going to denote it with a line on top of the um, i from a to b of j. And we're going to define that to be the infimum of all of the uh, possible upper sums. Likewise, we're going to define the lower integral to be the supremum of all of the lower sums. So we're going to say that if the upper integral is equal to the lower integral, then j is Darbo integrable on the closed interval a, b, and we define the integral from a to b of j of x dx to be equal to um, both the upper and lower integral. So going back to the proof, we're going to start by proving a lemma. So we've defined an arbitrary partition P. And we're going to show for that partition P that we have the P lower sum of F plus the P lower sum of G is less than or equal to the P lower sum of H. So let's let X sub I minus 1, X sub I be an arbitrary subinterval of P. And we're going to let X be an element of that subinterval. So by definition of the infimum of f on the subinterval, it follows that we have um, f of x and g of x are both greater than or equal to those particular infimums. And if we add these two inequalities together, we have, um, well, we have uh, m sub i f plus m sub i g is a lower bound of h. And since it's a lower bound of h, by definition of supremum, we must have um, we must uh, we must have it be the largest lower bound. So we have this inequality. And if we multiply it by delta x of i, the inequality does not change since delta x of i is positive. And this is true for any subinterval. So 
we have what we wanted to show, which is that the p lower sum of f plus the p lower sum of g is less than or equal to the p lower sum of h. Moving on to the second lemma for the same arbitrary partition, we're going to show that the p upper sum of h is less than or equal to the p upper sum of f plus the p upper sum of g. And this is going to work almost analogously to the, uh, or almost analogous to the uh, previous lemma. So we're going to let x of i minus 1 to x of i be an arbitrary subinterval of p and let x be an element of that subinterval. So by definition of capital M sub I F, which we define to be the supremum of F on this particular subinterval, it's going to follow that F is less than or equal to the supremum and G is also less than or equal to its supremum. So we add the two inequalities together again and we note that F of X plus G of X is a lower bound, or sorry, H of X is a lower bound of capital M sub I F plus capital M sub I G. And so by definition of M sub I H, it must be the least lower bound. So we have the following inequality that holds. And we can multiply by delta X sub I again, and we conclude that this is true for any sub interval. Hence, we have the sum from K is one to N of M sub K H times delta X of K, which is just the P upper sum of h is less than or equal to the p upper sum of f plus the p upper sum of g. So now for our third lemma, we want to show that for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a partition p such that the lower integral from a to b of f plus the lower integral from a to b of g minus epsilon is less than the p lower sum of f plus the p lower sum of g. And you might recognize this to be one property of supremums. And in fact, it is. So we can use the definition of, uh, we can use the definition of supremum here. So let us first fix an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. So by definition of supremum, we have the following. We have the lower integral of f is equal to the supremum of all of the lower sums of f. So that means there exists some partition p sub one of a, b, such that the lower integral from a to b minus f or of f minus any epsilon is less than L sub p one of f. And we're gonna choose that epsilon to be epsilon over two. And similarly, we have the same, uh, we have a, a, another partition p two that, um, that exists such that the lower integral from a to b of g minus epsilon over two is less than the p two lower sum of g. So continuing, we're going to take a new partition P to be the union of P sub one and P sub two. So we note that P sub one is a subset or equal to P and P sub two is a subset or equal to P. So that means P is finer than both P one and P two. And since finer partitions produce better lower sums, which are greater lower sums, we have the following two inequalities that hold. We can add these two inequalities together, and that is what we wanted to show. For the fourth lemma, we're gonna show the sim uh, a similar thing for the P upper sums. So we're gonna show that the P upper sum of F plus the P upper sum of G is less than the upper integral from A to B of F plus the upper integral from A to B of G plus epsilon for any epsilon. And, and that's for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a partition such that that is true. So we're going to begin by fixing an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. So then by definition of infimum, this time we have the following. We have the upper integral from A to B of F is equal to the infimum of all of the upper sums of F. So we know by this definition, there must exist some partition P1 of AB such that the P1 upper sum of F is less than the upper integral from A to B of F plus, and we've chosen this epsilon to be epsilon over two. Similarly, we have the uh, upper integral for G and there exists another partition P2 such that the following inequality is true. So once again, we're gonna take a new partition P to be the union of P sub one and P sub two. We note that P is finer than both P1 and P2 and that we have the following two inequalities because finer partitions produce lower upper sums. So we add the two inequalities together, and this is exactly what we wanted to show. 
For our fifth lemma, we want to show that the lower integral from a to b of f plus the lower integral from a to b of g is less than or equal to the lower integral from a to b of h. So we're going to first look at lemma one, and we note that for our arbitrary partition p that we have fixed, the p lower sum of f plus the p lower sum of g is less than or equal to the p lower sum of h. So let us fix an arbitrary epsilon, and by the, the third lemma, which we just showed, we have the following inequality that holds. So if we add in lemma one to this inequality, we have the following chain of inequalities. And the last part here follows that um, the lower integral is the supremum of all of the lower sums. So it must be greater than or equal to the p lower sum of h. Okay, now we note quickly that we have for any x, we have if um, for all epsilon one that are greater than zero, if x is less than epsilon one, then we must have x is less than or equal to zero. And this really follows by a simple proof of contradiction. So if we rearrange this uh, inequality from above, uh, we have the following. And so if we choose x in this definition to be the lower integral from a to b of f plus the lower integral from a to b of g minus the lower integral from a to b of h, then we must have the following is less than or equal to zero. And if we move the uh, lower integral from a to b of h to the other side of the inequality, we have exactly what we wanted to show. Similarly, for lemma six, we're now going to show that the upper integral from a to b of h is less than or equal to the upper integral from a to b of f plus the upper integral from a to b of g. So we look at lemma two, and we first note that the p upper sum of h is less than or equal to the p upper sum of f plus the p upper sum of g for the arbitrary partition p that we have fixed. Now we're going to fix another arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. And by lemma four, we have the following inequality that holds. So once again, we note that um, the upper integral is the infimum of all of the upper sums, so it must be less than or equal to the p upper sum of h. So we have this chain of inequalities. Rearranging things, we can come to the same conclusion as before, where we have um, some number x is less than epsilon, and we conclude that it must be less than or equal to zero. And so we have exactly what we wanted to show. Okay, and now we can put everything together and we can prove theorem one. So continuing the proof from earlier, before we started all of the lemmas, we're going to note that by definition of the Darbo integral, that the lower integral is always less than or equal to the upper integral. So then we can combine lemmas five and six using this property to get the following chain of inequalities. And now we can use our assumption that f and g are Darbo integrable. So we have the integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to the lower integral from a to b of f plus the lower uh, plus the or is equal to the upper integral from a to b of f. And we have the same thing for g. And note that we didn't have to use this assumption until now, that all of the lemmas we proved earlier did not depend on the fact that f and g are integrable. So uh, we can add this into our chain of inequalities and we can conclude that these two values must be equal because we have a squeezing effect, not the squeeze theorem, but we have a, a squeezing effect here where we have some form of uh, A is less than B or A is less than or equal to B is less than or equal to A. So B must be equal to A. And we conclude that the lower integral from A to B of H is equal to the upper integral from A to B of H. So by definition of the Darbo integral, that means H is integrable on AB. And it also means that the integral from a to b of h of x dx is equal to the integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the integral from a to b of g of x dx, which is exactly what we wanted to show. And that completes the proof.